Hello and welcome to Lens Life, where we discuss the impact of glass as well as we are here to inspire, educate, and motivate. And today I am so excited to have Jason Schuler with Awaken Films. Jason, thank you so much for joining us today. It's awesome, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Very exciting what you're doing with Lens Life and I just align with the same sort of lifestyle things that you're promoting. It's, it's great. That's awesome. So. Um, just for our viewers and listeners, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, who you are, where you've come from, and a little bit about that journey? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, many, many years ago, even before high school, I was just enamored by cameras, by um, storytelling. Back in the day, I'm dating myself, I had, I had access to a VHS camera, and that was the sort of top-of-the-line consumer way to make home movies and it was super fun. I have all these old <laughs> home movies of like, you know, creative ideas and most of them are absolute garbage, but they showed a spark for storytelling. They showed a knack for um, even looking through a lens. You know, I, I look back at some of them and it's like my angle might have been a little bit Dutch, but it's because I was holding this big thing on my shoulder at 10 years old, you know. Fast forward um, into my 20s. Uh, did some other side jaunts, really wanted to have uh, an education in film, but uh, just my parents didn't have the resources. And as a kid, I ended up learning a trade right out of high school, which was no, no bad thing. It was, I was a carpenter, which is awesome. Uh, but I always had this love for uh, film, for video, for uh, photography, and most importantly, for storytelling. And so I saved up and bought myself a camera in my 20s and just said, you know what, I wanna give this a shot. And that quickly turned into a part-time freelance style, uh, I guess you'd call it videography or camera operator. Um, and I was doing small projects for other people. And um, then I realized it really was becoming full-time and I was, it was all I was doing. And then very quickly realized I needed some help. It was just too, uh, too much work for one person. And so long story short, I had an assistant and then I had my first full-time employee and have since grown so that it's not really, what I do isn't about Jason Schuler. it's about Awaken Films, which is a small company that uh, I run with my wife and we tell stories for corporations and nonprofits. And it's very exciting, every day is different and I love what I do. That is awesome. And I, I'm sure that was a, a hard thing to do because there's so much packed into that story. Um, but yeah, very cool. And I, so I guess during that time when you're growing, um, did you continue to do carpentry and just kind of do it on the side and, and then it just built organically? 100%. You know, I, I think it's, it's about your aversion to risk and that risk reward sort of ratio. For me, I'm a little bit more conservative in my risk taking. I see opportunities and immediately I know that I want to do that. And I want to go after that, but I hedge it typically. That's just my personality. So yes, I would have been doing like lots of different things for income generation while I was starting out. Um, I would have been doing carpentry or other little random projects. I would have been doing, even, even taking on, if someone brought me like a graphics type project and I wasn't really strong in graphics, I might use most of the money just to hire someone else or all the money or even invest in their project to hire someone else to have something on my reel as something that we could do as a collective company. So there was always an investment into one myself. Um, and I think if people ask me for advice, it's the most comfortable way I can push them forward, which is, yes, you should jump out of the plane, but you should also have a parachute. You should also know that it's not gonna be immediately taking off and shooting for the moon. You might plummet a bit, so let's have some kind of a glider and a way to sort of soften that blow as you get better and better. And really, I look back, it, was, it was, seems so quick, but in the day when I'm, you know, I have a young family, I, I now have two kids, it wasn't always easy. There were times where it was like, geez, okay, I've got this, I'm shooting this high-end red carpet experience in Manhattan today, and tomorrow I'm strapping on a tool belt. But that's okay. That was my life, and that was where I knew I had a goal, and I knew I had a desire, and I knew I didn't want to just live off of like savings, or worse, get into debt, just to try to finance my dream. I knew I could do them both if I do them, did them smartly. That's awesome. I, I just love hearing these stories and that's what I want to do here is, is tell those stories to inspire. And uh, I, I think it's just incredible, you know, no formal education, just a passion for it. 
and wow. and just going for it and um, it growing organically. And I think that's just incredible. It's awesome. Phil, if, if I can do it, anybody can do it. It's it's not easy work, but it's not complex. So you got to put the effort in. You have to really, for me, the biggest thing I had to learn was changing of hats. And what I mean by that is I wanted to be the camera operator. I wanted to be the cinematographer, but really I had to be the salesman first. And then I had to be the sort of business development person, uh, client liaison, holding their hand through the pre-production process. Then I got to be the cinematographer. Sometimes I was the, D I was the DP and hiring other people on set too. So I was kind of the producer as well. And then on the back end, I was the editor. And then on the back back end, I was the bookkeeper doing all the invoicing and everything. And I am so thankful we've grown beyond that place. Um, but that experience really helped me to grow as a human being and to grow as a business owner and to grow as a creative, to know that like, it's not all about right-brained activities. I have to also think left-brained in order to get to the place where I want to be. Yeah, and that brings up a, a interesting point is that that can be very overwhelming. I feel like a lot of creatives don't have that way of thinking of doing the back end and the business side of that. Um, would you agree that a good way to maybe learn that? I mean, I had the privilege of working alongside of you as a PA um, and just having you as like a, a mentor kind of, and that I learned so much doing that. Is, is that something you recommend or how, you know, someone who maybe has the creative, but they, that business side overwhelms them. Do you have any recommendations there? Well, 100%, I think real world experience trumps schooling any day. There's nothing wrong with schooling. I want for my kids to go to university and to explore their education, but there's nothing like being in the trenches and getting shot at to help you realize, okay, this is real, but I can also find a way through it. I can also succeed despite the craziness. Um, I think in terms of the business side, having some mentors is super important. I still have mentors to this day. I'm in my early 40s and I have people that I call on Different, different uh, people in different industries. You know, they're not all like cinematographers or uh, business, um, video business owners. Some of them are in totally disparate businesses. Some of them are business owners. They're in real estate or whatever. But I have these people that I call on to say, you know, I, I want to talk through this idea. I want to bounce something off of you. I want to learn. I want to glean because they've already gone through the trenches. They've already gotten shot at in the way that I haven't. And if they can give me one or two or three pieces of advice that propel me forward by a few steps, I'm game. I mean, that is such a beautiful way to learn, both being in the trenches, but also learning from others' mistakes and learning from other successes. So I'd recommend on the business side, particularly when it comes to like someone wanting to be a, a well-rounded human in business, not just all I do is look through a lens, it's really good to have mentors. It's really good to step out of your comfort zone and do different things and to take on different projects and to get in the trenches. Absolutely. Um, one more point to this. Um, I know that you, it, it kept coming to my mind, Gordon Ramsay, but it's Dave Ramsay that you listen to all the time. And I think that um, the financial piece is huge in terms of investing in your business, in your future, taxes, all of that. Um, you know, can you talk about that a little bit and, and why you have such a focus on that and have been so smart in that end? Yeah, hundred percent. So Dave Ramsey is a, a dude whose um, whole life mission is around helping people become better financially. Um, being a good steward, which is basically like a manager, being a manager of your own finances and getting to the point where you're not in debt, you're not living paycheck to paycheck, but most importantly, you've saved and provided for your family future and you're starting to think outward about your society, your community, the world around you, and you become a philanthropist. Uh, my goal, I'm gonna throw it out there, my goal is to give away $1 million in one sitting at one point in my life. I don't know how it's gonna happen, I gotta find that million dollars first, but you know, it's different to say over a lifetime I gave away a million dollars, which is also a great goal, but I'd like to be able to do it in one sitting at one point. Um, so that does mean that I have a lot of work to do to sort of prepare for that. Um, but the idea I I through all this, the thread is that I want to be, uh, I want to enjoy life. I don't want to be worried about where that next paycheck is coming from. I want to see an opportunity and be able to take advantage of that opportunity. And that only comes from 
uh, in my experience, from uh, saving up for those opportunities, for planning ahead financially for those opportunities. And so, yeah, I forego some of the things like, uh, you know, you would probably laugh at the vehicle I drive, but I'm okay with that right now. Could I get a better vehicle? Yeah, I've thought about it, but right now it's not a value to me. Right now I'm good with what, what I'm driving and it's paid off and it's, it's a beautiful feeling. I sleep well at night. And more importantly, when I see a studio closing because it, it's happening like every day, when I see a studio closing around me and they're selling off gear at like 10% of the value, I can go over with a trailer and just say, yes, 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 no, no, yes, 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 and not have to worry about how are my kids gonna eat today. When I see an opportunity with, with uh, business and maybe there's a project that I'm not gonna get paid for 60, 90, or 120 days, but I know it's a great opportunity, I can front that and, and, and I can float that because I have the cash flow to float it. So everybody's different and there's no necessarily wrong way to deal with this, um, but I am a strong believer in paying yourself first, saving up for that opportunity, and thinking about the hard things like taxes. Think about it today so you don't get slammed with this big tax bill at the end of the year. You know, Don't spend all the money first and then you have nothing left. Think about it ahead of time, plan for it, and, uh, and it's been good, it's been a good ride. That's awesome. I can't wait to uh, get a text from you saying that you wrote that check because I, I know you will. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> Um, all right, so let's get into some of the fun stuff. So the impact of glass. Um, I think people right now are going to be able to firsthand see the impact of glass um, based on what they're looking at through me and through you. So, um, I, you know, I, I've got a C100 here with a really crappy kit lens. And, um, you know, it's going to be fine and everything, but uh, I think your setup is a little bit better. So. Right there, some people are going to see the impact of glass. And I know there's a lot, you know, on social media, everyone's so like kind of enamored with gear and equipment and stuff like that. So let's just take um, someone who's looking to get a new setup and we'll just call it a thousand dollars. If this doesn't exist, just so we know, but let's just say a body for 200 and the glass for 800 versus glass for 200 and the body, you know, better body for 800. What would you recommend and, and why? It's a great question. It's a great case study. Yes, it doesn't quite exist in those numbers, but um, it, it, it absolutely illustrates a great point. My opinion, and I think most people who have grown to a certain level would have a similar opinion, is that certain things are depreciating assets and certain things will hold their value. So a uh, camera body, is the day you buy it is gonna be worth less, probably 20%, maybe 12%, 15% less. The day you buy it. And in a year, it's probably 30 to 40% less. In three to five years, it's probably worth 70% less than when you bought it. A camera lens is likely to be worth, in five to 10 years, 50 to 80% of what you paid for it. It's not gonna be worth uh, more unless there's some kind of special factor there that it's, it's rare or something. Um, but the likelihood is that it's, uh, it's going to hold its value way, way better. Now, financially asi set aside, it's also about the way that we, um, the tools that we have to tell the story that we want to tell. And back when I started with VHS and then with mini DV, and then, you know, with, uh, I was in P2 with uh, Panasonic and the early 720, uh, 720p cameras, just reaching slightly into high def. There were, there were huge changes every year in a sensor and a camera. And if you bought something in you know, 2001 versus 2004, huge difference. Now we're in the 2020s, 2021. People watching this might be 2022 and beyond. There's not as big of a difference between the camera bodies. And so a camera body that was like, you know, four years old, six years old, is gonna make great images. So I personally think investing in a better piece of glass it makes fiscal sense, but also frees up capital for um, focusing on your craft and the other ways that you need to focus on it. If you, if you plow it into, let's say, a new red camera body, which you're never going to get for $800, um, that red that's top of the line today is going to be outdated in two, three, four years. And you've lost, you know, on a $30,000 or $50,000 or $100,000 camera body, you've lost a lot of value. It might still, you know, let's say it's 50%, you've lost 20, 30, 40, $50,000. Whereas if it's a DSLR, 
that's dated, you maybe lost $500 or $300. So it's definitely fiscal, but I think now that we live in this day and age where we have access to these amazing sensors, 4K is easy, 8K is becoming easy. Um, you know, there, there's, there's less of a reason to say, I've gotta get the latest and greatest camera body because three years ago, that camera body was awesome and it still is today. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, that speaks to me big time. I've never really invested much in glass because I, I don't have as much of a payback. I don't do it as often, but I really, that's something I'm excited to do moving forward. Can we talk a little bit about glass? Just two minutes here? Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I want to just share some of my favorite, you know, various lenses. We don't, we're in a similar place that you're in, Phil. Our clients expect a certain thing and also um, just assume that something will look a certain way. So we need the right tool for that, but they're also not expecting something different. So for example, I couldn't buy a $100,000 cinema lens or lens set. I just saw on, uh, on Facebook t today, this morning, $200,000 lens set. It was like Airy Master Primes or something. Like, I'm sure they're awesome. I've never used them. They sound amazing. I couldn't justify that besides the fact that it's a house in a case right, the cost of a house, um, it, my clients would never know the difference. I couldn't return on that investment. However, what I have noticed is having the right tool for the right, for the right job is important. So uh, we tend to invest mostly in Canon because we have Canon bodies. So uh, Canon L series lenses, the photo style lenses have been really great for us. We also have a set of uh, the Canon Cine Primes, uh, which run like f between three and $5,000 per lens. Those are beautiful, much more robust. You get the uh, smooth iris. But the glass um, isn't way better. It's probably very similar to the L series, like the 50 L lens, which is what we're shooting on right now. It's an autofocus lens. It's, I don't know, maybe it's uh, 1800 bucks or 1500 bucks. Um, we also have the L Cine Prime, which is maybe three, four, 5,000. I don't know what it is today. Um, optically, it's probably quite similar because they're, you know, it's the same company, similar glass, um, but you get a different sort of housing in the body, which is more robust. You get the iris that can open and close in a better way. Breathing might be a little bit better. Um, but I think it's not just about reaching for the one best lens. It's about thinking broadly. Okay, I probably need a good wide angle. I'm a huge fan of the 16 to 35 on a full frame. Uh, we also have a couple of those uh, 10 to 22s uh, for the Super 35. Um, they're super cheap, but they just, they, they fit on a gimbal. They're just easy to use. Um, we also, you also need a mid-range zoom. I love the 24 to 105. It's just all around her a good lens. Uh, we also invested in those servo, the Cine servo lenses by Canon. They're maybe about five grand a pop, um, but they're really nice. They can have that nice smooth iris. They're parafocal, meaning I can set focus, zoom in, focus doesn't change. I can zoom out, focus doesn't change. That's beautiful if you're doing dock style and you really wanna up your game, you need a parafocal lens. Um, and then obviously on the, on the, the tele end, something like a 7200 is a beautiful lens, just gets you that extra reach. But a few of those other sexy fun lenses, I actually picked up a pair of, uh, or a set of these old Russian primes um, a couple months ago, and they've been really fun to play around with. They're, they've got tons of chromatic aberration and they're, they're kind of dirty, um, but they've just, they've got this like old analog feel to them that sort of re-inspired me a bit. Um, and we also have a couple other fun lenses. We have this probe lens, which we used on a shoot. I think we're going to talk about coming up, but, uh, it's like this long wide angle macro lens that really gets you this field of view that you'd never seen before. Typically a macro lens is telephoto, but to have a wide macro is like really unique and different. So lens, I love glass. I love lenses. I have to be selective about it. We probably have, I would guess and say 30 lenses here, maybe 40 lenses here but there's a reason almost every single one sees use probably every week. If not every couple of weeks, we use every single one. Yeah, that's awesome. Very cool. So switching gears a little bit, but still talking about the impact of glass. So um, for me, like one of the rewards of what I do is getting a call or a text from a client saying, Hey, um, the house you shot just sold first day, five offers in five hours or something like that. Um, your line of work is much different, but do any stories come to mind of, you know, what's the reward for you? Like, what's the impact of glass with what you do? Great question. And I agree. There's some kind of um, emotional payoff that you can't really describe until you get it. You know, landing a contract, selling, closing a deal, it feels really good. Um, 
and, and like finishing something you're proud of feels really good. But when that person who's an outsider, who maybe even invested in it, that's, you know, it has these same fears that we all have, like, is my business going to grow? How am I going to pay for my kid's college or braces? You know, when they come back and say, this helped us close this deal, or this helped us raise this money. What a feeling. What a, it's, it's like, um, affirming to everything you and I do as creatives. Um, and as marketers. So yeah, I don't have an exact specific story, but I'll give you some, some general examples. You know, some of our clients have literally raised millions of dollars with our video. Is it because of our video? No, they did it as, as a whole, um, thrust of fundraising. Was our video a key part of that? 100%. Without that video, people aren't feeling emotionally connected. And you know what they say, the pocketbook is connected to the heart. And so if you can reach into that heart and touch something deeply powerful, people will open their pocketbook and invest. Um, also building a tribe, you know, seeing nonprofits uh, build a tribe of people and getting volunteers excited about their mission. And I feel like I'm part of, I'm changing the world, even though I'm sitting in an edit suite or I'm, I'm on the phone leading a small team of creatives. You know, I feel like I'm changing the world through these nonprofits. And so when they come back and say, we've done X or Y or Z, or we've accomplished this, I feel like I've been part of that accomplishment. And you know, one, one small story is we had a client that was super excited about their project um, and they ended up sharing it with the New Jersey Ad Club. There's these awards every year um, in, in New Jersey and there probably are ad clubs around the country. Um, and our video ended up winning um, its class. I forget what the style, I think it was best marketing video or something. And then it won best in show. It won two awards that year. Um, best, best in show basically means it was the best thing that they saw come out that year. So super exciting. That feels so validating for someone to say, well done. But the truth is, I got to keep at it. Whether people recognize it or not, part of it's artistry, part of it's a drive internally to go after that. And part of it is, I am beholden to my clients. They're my bosses and I want to do good for them. I want to serve them. So no matter what, whether I get recognized or not, or not whether a client comes back and says, you did this, this, and this, well done, or they, it's just radio silence. I've got to keep pushing to make myself better, both buying better gear, practicing, learning new tricks of the trade, and making sure that I have the best possible product to offer my clients. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, you, you were instrumental in the vision for me of Lens Life because I just think about what you do and that impact. Like, you don't know all the stories because they, they're not told. Um, but you know, you've, I'm sure saved a life or, you know, raised money that has saved a life. And so that, that's just like, in like so crazy. And I love to think about it because we don't, we might never know in this life what we've done. Um, but it's, you know, I, I think it's an honor, a privilege to be a, a part of someone's story or, or whatever that is. And you specifically, your ability to tell a story is, I think, you know, incredible. So I, I do want to go into that because any, anytime I watch one of your videos, I'm like moved, you know, you, you put the, the music to it and then your ability to tell the story and then by the end you're crying. And I, if I can make someone cry, that that's, that's a good day for me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, you, you know, the, the ticket to someone's money or whatever to, to move the heart uh, is a beautiful thing. So I am not really good at this, but this is your strong suit and, you know, let's, I don't even know how to jump into it, but you know, anytime I try to tell the story, I go into it, I know what I want the story to be. And then I'll be behind the camera and be asking the questions and I'll get just rambling and audio bites that I can't connect and it's a hot mess. So let's talk about tips. Um, and how, how you do this, like what have you learned over the years and anything you can talk about this? Yeah, great feedback and I'm with you, you know, we can make light of it. The truth is do, telling an impactful story, whether it is for a corporation selling a product or service, whether it's for a nonprofit um, fixing our community um, or whether it's just narrative for fun, there's something deeply powerful about that. On the documentary side, which is what you're kind of describing, you know, in, using interviews as your A-roll to tell that story. 
I had the same slippery slope that everyone had in trying to learn how to do this. And yes, I might have a little bit of an internal gift, but I had to put the time in to figure this out. And I do have a few tips and techniques that I'm happy to share with you today and with your your viewers today. Um, But I think the biggest thing is to say, no matter how good or bad you are, put the time in. Uh, just just grow, learn, watch videos, watch documentaries to see what worked. Why did it work? Why did that pull in your heart? Get, uh, as a guy, I'm just going to say it, get comfortable with being emotional. Get comfortable with feeling your emotions and sensing. I, I actually almost have like, a, like an ear on my heart or like a nose on my heart. It sounds ridiculous, but I, I like smell for that, that smell or I listen for that little noise that happens during the interview where I'm like, okay, I've touched on something. Now I got to go a little deeper here. Um, And that's something that only happens through both having a gift, but more importantly, growing it, practicing. Uh, Okay, but let's get into some key things. So first of all, every interview has to start with say and spell your first and last name. Last thing you want is somebody to, you know, to leave and you don't have the prepper spelling or in the edit, you put a lower third up or whatever, or you forget you're working with another editor and they don't know who this person is. You need that context. I also say, say and spell your first and last name and tell us what your job description or job title is in this context. Second thing is I always give a small preamble during this preamble. If someone else is operating camera, they know that I need to be filming. Um, and it gives them a chance to sort of check focus, to check audio levels. That preamble includes things like, um, there's no one's going to hear me in the final piece. So you need to give context. I'll usually say something like, for example, if I said, what'd you have for breakfast? And you say eggs, it works in our conversation because people heard me ask the question, but the editor, all they have is eggs and we can't do anything with that. But secondarily, we also need to know shorter is better. Don't feel like you need to tell the story from 1974 through to 2021. It doesn't work. Shorter is better. Let's get, um, Let's get those, those story in sound bites and trust that I will ask a follow-up question. And with your permission, I usually say this as well, with your permission, I might ask the question a second time because we have a long version and that's great, but we likely need the shorter version. And that's sort of the preamble I do to get started to help them get comfortable. The last thing I'll usually say is, look, it's your interview. Um, this isn't like some kind of journalism thing where I'm digging deep to try to find the story. This is your story. I want to tell it in the best possible way. So if I ask a question, and I didn't ask the right question, answer the question you wish I asked. That's totally kosher. If I ask something that doesn't make sense, you could just, you know, say it doesn't make sense and we move on. Um, But that's sort of the way I start every interview. I think it helps people to feel at ease. It also sets some housekeeping sort of ground rules that help them to understand that um, they are telling the story. I'm not telling the story. They're the mouthpiece to tell their own story. Getting into the nuts and bolts. How do you tell a great story with an interview? Obviously the setting should feel good. Um, it should be familiar, not to, if you don't need to, don't use the brightest light. Um, I mean, the light that we're using today is probably no brighter than uh, a window that's full of, um, you know, overcast day. It's not very bright. Um, you you want to make them feel comfortable. The mask thing, I'm telling you, man, it's really hard to, t- to do an interview with a mask. Um, and that's all we do right now um, because we want the person on camera to be unmasked. Um, but it's really hard because a lot of what you see in reaction comes from the mouth and the nose and the eyes and the nods, but it's not as easy. Um, but typically I'll, I'll ask questions sort of in a chron- chronological uh, way. The edit doesn't end up that way. We tend to move things out of chronology for effect, but people tend to think chronolo- chronologically, and I think it helps us to just feel comfortable about telling that story. Um, I will also ask questions that are open-ended, that are intentionally not a yes or no question. So if I say, um, uh, do you like Burger King? They're gonna say yes or no, but I can say, how, d- how do you feel about fast food? There's no yes or no to that, right? So I'm asking questions that are automatically uh, evoking a, a sort of deeper response. Um, I'm also thinking about things like, when they're talking, I'm thinking like an editor. I'm listening to the beginning of it and I'm saying, no good, no good. Okay, right there, I could start. All right, I'm listening, listening, listening. All right, that's all I need for that. This is all garbage, but I think I can get away with it. Please, 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 I'll think of this, this phrase, and I know you know this phrase. Please land the plane. Please land the plane. They're just rambling on and on and on and on and on. And then finally, they say that last phrase that I describe as landing the plane. Um, and sometimes they don't say that last phrase. But as an editor, I'm thinking, okay, I've got the beginning, all this junk in the middle that's gone. Yes, that'll work. Got it. Moving on. Or I'm thinking like an editor, they didn't land the plane. 
okay, I gotta ask this again. And I'll usually ask the same question in a different way. So I heard you say X, Y, and Z. I'm just wondering if you can impact that a little bit, particularly, and I'll reference the ending that I'm looking for and see what it comes. And, and if nothing um, fits there, I'm, I have no shame. I'm a marketer. And even as a nonprofit telling your story, I'm telling the story that you need to be told. So I have no shame in saying, okay, we have the long answer. You did a great job. I need a short answer. And it needs to sound like this. You started with this, the middle bit I don't really need, and you end with something like this. I just need you to end it strongly. And I have no problem with telling them what they said, but in a better way. Um, now granted, if I was shooting a documentary that was you know, financed um, to tell a journalistic story, I can't do that. That's not the way we do it. But as marketers, there's nothing wrong with helping people, coaching them in a way that helps them to sound good. And we need to think like an editor while we're interviewing, because the edit starts while you're filming. The edit doesn't start the day you get into post. Um, so for this style that you're talking about, do you um, send questions ahead of time to the client? Typically, no. Um, some people ask, and if I feel pressured, I will send them. Um, for example, if I'm interviewing a Fortune 500, Fortune 100 CEO, their assistant will always be like, I need the questions in advance. So I'll send it because I know it's just, it's just the cost of doing business. Um, but I always reserve the right to ask something different. Um, but typically, no. You know why? People can rehearse. They tend to do like a speech. For example, you and I talked about what we would talk about in advance. Um, but we didn't go into every single detail. You know, if you gave me something in advance and said, hey, prepare for this. And I didn't know what I was doing and I felt nervous. I'm going to write a speech and that's garbage. It just turns out so bad. The person's, I am like a robot talking like a robot, you know, or they get stuck because the light's on, people are in the background. They realize this is their big moment and they're flubbing it. I just want that pressure to fall away. So I typically don't share the questions in advance. If they get nervous, I'll just say, oh, I'll ask, it's all stuff that you know. I'll ask something about, you know, the core pillars of your business. I'm going to ask about your customer. Maybe give me an example of somebody that, you know, a project that went, went really well or somebody that was happy with your product or service. And I'll just leave it really loose so that they know, okay, I got this stuff. And then during the interview, I can flex. If I catch on something that's really, really powerful, we dig into that. If it's sort of like, well, this stuff's not really usable, then we just move on quickly because I don't need an hour-long interview to tell a two-minute story. Now, sometimes some of our doc stuff, we might film six, eight, 10 hours of interviews. Um, Brad's working on a project right now that has over 24 hours of interviews, but that's more of a pet project for us. And so we wanted to dig into it. Um, it's about the coronavirus, it's about young people and their experience uh, during COVID and quarantine. Um, but generally, if I'm telling a two minute story and I need three people to tell that story, I can do that in three 10 minute, one in, 10 minute interviews. And, and know that that person, I've already decided as the CEO, he's saying, this portion of the story. That person as the, you know, the, the person that turns the wheel, the cog guy, he's telling this slice of the story. So I don't need to ask them the same questions. I'm asking totally different questions, knowing that he's gonna talk 100,000 foot, he's gonna talk in the trenches, and she's gonna be the heartfelt call to action at the end. Done. Um, that, that's how I think a lot of times, um, but <laughs> more, more than often, I will I just get these people who are, have never been on camera before, and I will literally have 30 minutes of footage to try to squeeze out 45 seconds. And it's been <laughs> the most painful experience of my life. I guess, when, when do you go like doc style? When do you go straight to camera? When do you go scripted? When do you go question? Like, I, I, and that's a loaded question, but I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> I do, and I feel your pain, by the way, and all of us feel your pain, Phil. We've all been there and still are there at different times. Um, when you're doing doc style, these people are not talent, they're not practiced. Even if they talk in front of a boardroom or they um, raise money or they're in sales or whatever, it's totally different when you turn the camera on, you turn the lights on, and now you're being recorded. There's something that almost feels either shameful or, or maybe even like, um, you know, you, you get worried when the camera's on, that little red light flashes. By the way, here's a tip, turn your red light off. If you have a red light on your camera that says record, turn it off. They don't need to know that. We, we go into an interview and people don't, even, sometimes will say, was that it? Like they thought it was all just the pre-stuff because we don't even say, uh, unless we have to put on the show, camera rolling, camera speeds. All right, it's quite on the set, here we go, in action. We don't do any of that. We're just like, camera's already speeding, they don't know that. I asked the preamble questions, we're already filming all this, and then we're into it and they're like, oh, I guess, I guess we're going, I feel comfortable, right? Um, anyway, 
ask your question one more time because I have puppy brain. I've been up late at night with this waking puppy trying to go out to the bathroom. Uh, remind me of your question. You know, the, the, yeah, they, they freeze up. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, I guess well, one thing is when I was getting into this, everything was off camera, off camera. When do you know when to go off camera versus to the camera? When do you know to go scripted? Because I, I think for some people having it in front of them is such a comfort. But then you run into that thing where it's it's a robot. And I, I want to talk about that next with what you and I did together. But um, when do you know like which approach to take with which project, I guess? Yeah, great feedback. Great question. Um, you know, Phil, it partly is what the client wants. We sort of in that pre-production phase, even the sales phase, before we close on a contract, we're sort of flushing out, well, what are, what are your expectations? What are your goals? How are we going to do that? Sometimes budget means that we need to film doc style simply because they can't afford to have um, us do all this scripting or they can't afford to have us do some kind of narrative piece where we hire actors and create this scene. And that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Doc style truly is probably the, the cheapest way to do a video. Um, but oh, here's what I was gonna say to your point and then I promise you I'll get to that. I feel your pain and the truth is we need to, we need to give ourselves a break. The shorter the pieces, the harder it is to make dynamic and good, right? So give your, any of our viewers out there, just know that if, you're, if your aim is a 10, eight minute piece, sounds like, oh my gosh, that's so hard. It's not hard, especially a crappy 10 minute piece. It's not hard at all, right? If your aim is a five minute piece, it's dynamic. That's a little harder. If your aim is a 45 second piece from an hour long interview, that is really hard especially a good 45 second piece, because you need to think in small sound bites, you need to make sure you've covered those sound bites, and then you need the B-roll that's gonna support the coverage to tell that story in a short time. You don't have the two or three minutes to tell that story. The sweet spot for us is two to three minutes, by the way, for doc style stuff. Now, in terms of what, what usage, the client has a say in it, typically it's off camera. So right now, our setup, if you could see it, I think Chris is maybe taking a couple of behind the scenes photos, maybe we can share with you for your thing. Um, we're actually using like, uh, there's this old doc style guy called Errol Morris, um, famous documentary filmmaker. He had this thing, I think he called it the interrometer, where it was sort of like a mirror and a piece of glass and he would sit beside the camera, but the viewer would see a reflection of himself. I'm actually seeing you in front of the lens. We're using a tel teleprompter and we pumped zoom in because we're in different locations. Um, so in this case, I wanted to be able to look at you, but I also thought it was a value for me to look at your viewers. So your viewers are seeing me look right at them. Um, and some projects call for that. You know, whenever there's someone as an authority, almost like a host style, I call it host driven, that's where I think looking at the lens is important. It's one of the harder ways to be on camera. And so most people are gonna be more comfortable with talking to someone off camera and it being more doc style like this. Um, that's sort of the, the way that I flush it out in the pre-production phase and with the client in terms of looking at the lens, looking at the lens. In terms of scripting, I do think that everything we do has a certain element of scripting. Um, I would be doing the client a disservice and the interviewee, interviewee a disservice if I just showed up like not, not being prepared. Even you came to this thinking, all right, I wanna ask generally this stuff. You and I know each other, but especially if we don't know each other, you know, we need to be prepared as, as filmmakers on how to get that story and what we need to ask to get that story. So there's some level of scripting, but. Typically, I'm not a notes person. I don't bring a list of questions. I don't bring even a, a little notebook with, with ideas down. I've already sort of done the interview in my head and that's how I work. And I, and I like the flexibility of being able to say off the cuff, let's, let's ride this train a little bit. Let's go down this path. It's like a side adventure. Sometimes I strike gold and I'm so thankful. Sometimes it was a four or six minute adventure that like went nowhere and then we get back to it. Uh, no problem, no harm, no foul, but I think there's a level of scripting for everything. And as you get the bigger projects, the scripting I think becomes more and more. Um, if you're filming a doc style thing for Nike, you're probably really scripting most of it out. Um, even pre-interviewing people. Some of our bigger stuff, we did pre-interviews and we did a paper edit for one client in particular. We literally did phone interviews, then we did a paper edit. We had it all approved in advance, then did the interview. How did we get the same responses from the people from the phone, at, phone interview to the main interview, well, it wasn't easy. And some of the times we had to remind them and say, you know, when we were on the phone, uh, you mentioned it sort of like this, and then they would get back in that train of thought and share it. Um, so there's different levels. I feel like if, we are, if we're marketers, we should be a little more specific in like asking leading questions 
for telling a marketing story or maybe a, 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 a nonprofit kind of like heartfelt story, we should lead our interviewee towards the path to get to the destination we want. If we're more journalistic side, I think we probably need to be hands off and just sort of let it, let it go the way it is. Most of what I do is on that marketing side. Cool. Awesome. Loaded question, I know, and there's so much to it, but so give, give some, uh, some good tips. Um, all right, so you and I did a, a project recently for Lens Life, and um, it was an eye-opening opening experience for me uh, being in front of the camera. So I came into this uh, pretty much scripted and practicing and thinking that I was doing a great job and come to find out that it just wasn't translating. So it was the most valuable experience for me to have you push me basically. And um, I don't know, it was just, I think one of the most valuable experiences as someone who's behind the camera to get in front of it. 100%, I was actually gonna start with that if you didn't say it. There is something about being in front of the lens that um, is scary. I mentioned earlier, you know, with the recording side, maybe some people could feel shame about how do they la act or sound or even the sound of your own voice is weird until you, our, our, our jaws are vibrating and creating a different sound for ourselves than what other people hear. Um, so when you hear your own voice for the first time being recorded, it's like, ew, I sound like that? And yes, you do sound like that, but it sounds good. It sounds like you, which is what we expect. So. Um, there's something very valuable about being in front of the lens. And it, I think it helps us as filmmakers, as marketers, to know the sort of pain that comes in, but also to know like how to get over it. Um, so we did this awesome project together. I can't wait to delve into this, Phil, to, to sort of share a bit about our experience together with Lens Life and even your e-course. I'd love to talk a little bit about that. You're doing awesome stuff over there. Um, but I too will have been in front of the camera. Um, I have a, a, a video that's meant to be funny. I don't know how well we did in making it funny, but um, about our company and about our process. And um, yes, I'm not looking to make it the Jason Schuler show, but people do, people invest in people. So they, they buy me and they buy my team as much as they buy our products. So, um, you know, there's something about being in front of the camera that helps us to both sell and to tell our story, which is really important for the sake of lens life. Like we want to know who you are and we want to be aligned with who you are before we're going to, you know, give you our email or before we're going to, you know, buy a sticker or buy a shirt. Like I want to know that I align with you on things. And I think the video shoot we did together, um, helps share that story. And I appreciate you being willing to be pushed a little bit, by the way, for your viewers, you already had a good version, but it just felt a little bit scripted. It felt a little bit robotic. You know, it felt a little bit like, okay, I need to get this done. The goal is to finish what I'm saying. But really the goal was to tell a story. So adding a few pauses or inflection differences, I'm being dramatic, right? But the point is, instead of just reading it straight through, because we had a teleprompter for some of the stuff that we did with you, but instead of just reading it straight through or memorizing it and blah, spitting it out, you want to have those pregnant pauses. You want to say things in a way that it, almost sounds like you just thought of it right there, right? And that's part of that storytelling as on-air talent um, that someone who's a practiced um, actor or actress, they just live that every day and they can just do it. You and I, it's not easy. And our clients, it's probably even less easy because we're like doctors. We've seen the good, bad, and the ugly. We've seen you with your pants down, right? But when you're in front of the camera and it's your first time, You've never seen this happen before. You don't know that people flub it and it's okay. You just retake it and you edit out all the badness. So we have to be, again, like, like a doctor in that case too, to say, listen, don't worry. We see this every day. It's very natural. Why don't we take two minute break, grab some water, have a stretch. I also want to look at my notes. I usually blame it on me. I want to take a minute to look at my notes just to, just to get, I, I, I need to get in my right, my right, right head zone there for a second. Um, and then they come back in I might say one last thing. Hey, listen, by the way, I don't know if I told you in the beginning, we're only gonna use the best parts here. All the other stuff never sees the light of day. We're only cutting probably out of a half an hour with you or 20 minutes with you or an hour with you. We're using 30 seconds or 15 seconds. So just relax. And then it's like, wow, so much easier, so different. So two points that I, um, what were they? First one, I think it's so important to have like 
after I did a take, you were able to say, hey, check this out on the prompter and look at yourself because so many times I've had a project where I'm delivering the end, end result and they're like, oh, I don't like the way I looked or look at my hair or this and that. And I'm like, well, we're already done. So huge value in being able to show your client right there. Have a monitor on set, yep. And then um, something else that uh, I remember you talking about all the time is triage, right? So. 100%, I love triage. Let's talk about that. Yeah, like um, getting through the lines is one thing and there have been so many projects where that's all I do. And, and uh, you know, we've gotten through the lines and that's it, but to take and elevate your project to the next level is what you did with me. And all right, that was good, but I don't want just good. I want this to have impact and I want you to really come through. So let's, you know, and that's what it was. It was taking it to the next level. 100%, you know, that triage phrase, what it means for our viewers is um, you start with the main thing and keep the main thing the main thing. So when I'm even setting up, we talk about triage as a team. Uh, if we're pressed for time, maybe we're loading into Manhattan to New York City and the gatekeeper was like, where's your certificate of insurance? Well, we gave it to so-and-so. Did it make it to your desk? No, it didn't. Now they, they burned through half an hour looking for this COI. And then finally we get into the loading dock and then there's three stops with construction workers. And, you know, so sometimes triage just means, okay, we only have a half an hour to set up instead of an hour and a half. First things first, we need a camera. Nothing's going to happen without a camera. Second thing, we need audio. Nothing's going to happen without a camera and audio. Third thing, lighting. Fourth thing, set direction. Fifth thing, hair and makeup, all the other stuff that sort of comes. And really, the other phrase is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? At the bottom, it's like, it's like water. Without water, you die in three days. Or air, maybe, is the first one, right? Without air, you die in three sec 30 seconds or three minutes. Um, and then it's water, and then it's food. And then it, you get to the top, and it's like, I want a new iPhone, or I want a motorcycle, I want a new guitar, or whatever. And those are great things. But if you focus on the guitar first, and you don't have air, you got a big problem, right? Or if you focus on guitar first, and you can't afford food, you've got things backwards. The point of the pyramid is upside down, right? So same thing in our, in our filming, I think, to start with, you definitely want to just get, get what you need to get. If you're pressed for time, get the foundational stuff so you know you've got it. But as soon as you know you've got it, let's work on, on getting up that scale to the higher points, the more refined points. In the case of your, your stuff, I think we might have changed a couple lines from the original script to the final one, but it wasn't much. It was basically the same nuts and bolts. But what we changed was like your comfortability and your inflection and your delivery and just this sense of confidence you had from the first take to the last take, you knew that you were in good hands, but you didn't feel it at the first take. But by the last take, the one that we used, and usually you use the last take, um, you know, that last take was like, he nailed it. We all knew at that moment. I, I wish we had a BTS uh, video going there because it was like, nailed it. Yes, man, we got it done. Well done. And I, I I've heard you use this phrase and I use it a lot and I think I used it on myself in that interview is, well, we have a safety now, so let's just try it again. And I feel like that just like takes away the pressure. And a lot, and a lot of times those are the ones that end up getting used. But for me as an editor, I love having a safety. Um, but then I also love giving the client or myself in that case, the freedom to just play with it. 100%. I agree with you. I'm glad you brought that up. And also mark it. Sometimes we'll put a little hand in front of the lens or we'll look at a clip number or something. Um, so you know like three clips back was your, your good take in case the last one isn't good. There are times where we go through and like, all right, well, that didn't work. Uh, we'll go back to that third one. So either we'll say it on the last clip. It was three clips ago. That was the good one we liked. Or we'll have done like a hand in front of the lens or some way of marking it so that the editor can just like plow into the edit and they're not looking through troves of footage. They can get right to the best clip. Yes, yes, yes. Safety, nothing like that safety because the second one truly is usually better. Yeah, very, very true. That's been my experience. Um, all right, we've talked about so much. I really do want to land the plane. So maybe just touch on two more quick things. Um, one advice you gave me in the beginning was have specific examples of your work because um, I don't, I guess just people in general don't really have vision. Um, I know like in real estate world, that's why they stage a house because someone can't envision a vacant house staged. So in video, a client might come to your website 
and just look at your examples and say, I want that. <laughs> they don't know what they want, but they'll see it and they say, I want that. I'm with you, man. And it's, it's sad that we have to do this, but it's also, it's good for our craft. It's good practice. In my experience, it's exactly how it works. You know, we're selling ones and zeros. It doesn't exist. We're selling an idea. It's vapor. It doesn't exist. It's like a firing of a neuron in our brain with what we're selling. Um, and most people who are creative still might have a little difficulty to sort of climb inside your head and see what you mean, what they're buying. But most people that are buying from us aren't creatives. And so they need to know, they need to see, well, what's an example? Um, I think about, you know, commoditized things. It's it, when you go to the store and you're buying beef, you're buying based on, you know, price per pound, unless you heard the name, you know, filet mignon or some other like special Kobe beef that, you know, like, okay, it's worth more because I heard this marketing around this. But mostly you're just buying because it's three ninety nine a pound versus eight ninety nine a pound or whatever. That's not the way it is in video. And I don't want to race to the bottom price wise. So I need to help people see the value that I bring to the table. I'll give you a quick, sad story. Um, sad for me, but it, you know, it is what it is. We were working with an agency, did some projects with them. They're very happy. New client came in. <clears throat> I don't know that I should say the name, but it was a famous, I'll give you this. It was a, a famous taco manufacturer. Um, which we would all know household name, you know, product. Uh, they, they make tacos. And uh, we went as far as to create a pitch video. We actually literally created it because there was all this talk of like, well, what experience do you have in this particular type of food? And we didn't have a ton of experience. So we went as far as making a pitch video. We literally filmed in our office on a green screen, something similar to show that we have capability and we still lost it. And the person that got it, they, this is what the agency told us, the person that got it is because they had experience in food, including for one of their competitors. Wah, wah. You know, but the reality is, it is what it is. You can't win everything, but we could try. And so I think knowing that you want to get into a field, it doesn't hurt to like, um, let's say you want to get into the food field then you should be filming some food stuff and get that into your reel. Let's say you want to get into real estate, um, Maybe you should film an apartment, but I think you should also film a multi-million dollar McMansion, right? I think you should have both because the likelihood is there's more money for the mansion to do marketing than there is for the apartment. And if they only see the apartment, they might be like, ah, oh, this guy only does apartments. You know, so I think you need to show examples of what you do and you should show examples of what you aspire to do. That includes just doing freebie work. You know, whether it is for an actual client or it's some kind of spec project. We don't do much of that here, but we tend to do pitch videos. If it's a big project, we might pitch a, use a video to pitch the idea to them, sort of like an animatic. Um, but 100%, people need that vision to say, I want the Cheerios. I don't want the Rice Krispies. And if all you have are Rice Krispies, they can't see that you make cereal. They just see that you make Rice Krispies and that you don't make Cheerios. All right, so last little thing. Um... Uh, is about editing and you know delivering the project. So I, I know for me, I get so passionate and it's hard not to take these projects personally. Like I go into a project with a vision, I share the vision with the client and you know, especially when I first started out, I would do like same day edits, you know, up all night, delivered by the morning. Cause just like, and then <laughs> just like waiting by the phone or the, you know, for that call back and get that feedback of, oh, well, I don't like it. Or, you know, I, you know, I don't like this. And it's just so, how do you not take that personally? Um, how do you move past that to just provide a good service and give the client what they want? Great question. I think we all still take it personally um, to varying degrees. It's just human nature, especially for creatives. There is a heart connection to the right brain. You know, artistry is very emotional. And so you're going you're gonna to experience this. If you haven't, you will. If you have, you will again. It's just the nature of the work we do. But I think a couple things have sort of helped. Number one, it's mostly something small that they don't like. You have to just help them navigate that process. They don't know how to describe it. Usually it's the music, I'll be honest. Eight times out of 10, seven times out of 10, it's the music that they don't like. And they don't know that that's what they don't like. They're just like, oh, it's, if it's like, it's all wrong, it just feels so different, then I'd break it down. I just say, okay, let's talk about, knowing it's the music, maybe I'll say, let's talk about the visuals, you know, that we got. Are any of those feel wrong? No. 
Um, how about the, the, the A roll, like the, the interviews or the, the voiceover? Does that feel wrong? No. How about the music? Yeah, it's just totally wrong. There you go, right? So I think helping them unpack, because like the, the same question we had earlier, if you missed this, folks, rewind back the, the, the question about you know, interviews and how do, you, how do you navigate those interviews. I think in the same way, people need, they've never been in front of the camera. They've never been on camera. They've never been in front of the lights. They need, to, they need you to help them navigate this process of like, it's not done until you say it's done. And we're collaborating together. And hopefully we have synergy when we collaborate. Synergy means one plus one doesn't equal two. One plus one equals three or four. So hopefully that collaboration isn't like pejorative and angry and like the clients blah, 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 pooing all over your creativity. Hopefully they're like, nah, it doesn't, doesn't hit it. But what if we did this? And you say, yeah, and, and they say, yes, and, and suddenly you're on something really, really cool. So I think unpacking, helping them unpack it is the biggest part. The second part is, remember, they paid for this. It's their piece. If you want to do something for you, re-edit it. Make a, make a, make a director's cut for you. Um, it might mean that it can't go public and it's your private one, but you can share it when your sales process. You know, we have an example of this on the website, but there were some changes made. Here's the original director's cut I want to share. Nothing wrong with that, as long as there's nothing wrong with your contract with the person. I think as well, save those battles for when it really is a battle. You know, when you know, you know 100% this is the right way to do it, go to war. M most of the time, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. They've paid for it. It should be right for them. And I think as creatives, to grow a little bit of thicker skin is a good, healthy thing for us. Um, I don't think that we should be jaded. That's the opposite problem. And suddenly we're not going to be good at being creatives because we're going to lose the heart. You know, how many people said that when you're watching a sports game or even an artist? And you're like, that person has no heart. What happened? You know, this season, they just... They're just not in it, you know, and the same thing can happen for us. So you don't, you don't want to grow hard hearted and all calloused, but I think thicker skin to say, to know that like, usually it's the music, right? Or usually it's some other small thing, the way they look on camera. There's some, here's one other Phoebe for your viewers. A lot of times it's the thumbnail, right? Yeah. Let's say you use YouTube or we use Vimeo, a private link. You know, if we don't pick the right thumbnail and they're like, oh, it just looks terrible. Well, that's not the thumbnail you have to use, right? You can use anything you want, upload, upload a picture of your grandma. I mean, I don't care, you use any thumbnail, but they don't know that. They think that the thumbnail is like the first people thing people are gonna see and they feel like, yuck. <laughs> I run into that all the time. And the funny part is they don't know what a thumbnail is. So they're describing it. I don't like how the video starts. Exactly. And you're thinking like, is it the opening graphic? Is it like the color grading? Is it the music? No, it's the thumbnail. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> I guess it's just there. I don't think there's any solution to this, but it's so frustrating when they come back like angry, you know, or like, so like, uh, like just outraged or, you know, and it's like, but yeah, when you unpack it and find that specific thing, but you know, almost like you don't want to change it or you don't want to be them to be happy. I mean, that's our goal, right? It's to, for them to love it. Yeah. And you know, it, pe people want to work with nice people. You and I have had both great clients and some not so great clients. And the reality is you're going to take the project with the good client any day over the other one. In fact, I've learned in my business, life's too short. If I can phase out some of the stuff that I don't enjoy or some of the people I don't enjoy working with, I've done that in my life. You know, the people that just nickel and dime me to death and just take advantage of every good thing that I try to give for free. And then it's like they want another thing for free and another. It's like, no, thanks. I'm not interested. You know, um, where those other folks that are are they might still have strong opinions, but they're just nice about it all day. I'll bend over backwards serving them. And so. Um, I'm trying to be the type of person that I want to work with and I look for those people and clients. So I think some of that might be as you grow, you can charge a little more as you have better work, you can make a little bit more profit. And as you have a, a larger client base, you can get rid of some of the, the sort of bottom barrel stuff and not have to even work with them anymore. Um, if they're angry about it, that's a sign that there's an emotional internal struggle that they're dealing with that is not connected to your video or your editing skills, right? It's something different going on that they're just mad at the world and it's just, you happen to be the punching bag today. So, um, but I think, you know, definitely it's gonna happen to all of us if it hasn't. Know that it's gonna happen, don't be afraid of it. Navigate it with grace and poise and know that likely it's something very small. Yeah, and that's a theme that I've noticed talking to different people is that as you grow, 
you're going to run through that. Um, but as you build your confidence, you can raise your prices, you can kind of decide who you work with. And that's just a part of the growing, the growing process. Dude, talk about your e-course because that's exactly the kind of mentoring that people need. You know, this is great for a uh, half an hour, or maybe we've gone longer, but um, it's just a shot in the arm and they need like that regular kind of mentoring. They need that regular education to get them through. Tell us what you're doing about the e-course here. Sure, yeah. So, um, you know, essentially Impact the Glass for me is that someone introduced me to a camera and it changed my life, um, allowing me to build a career as a real estate photographer um, and, you know, do something not sitting at a desk, not doing a nine to five, um, exploring the creative side of life and making money at it. Like, it's just, I never, you know, if you asked me as a high schooler, what am I going to do growing up? Never would have guessed this is it and never knew this existed. Now it's more popular than it was when I first got into it. But essentially, I want to have an impact like that was had for me to as many people as I can. So the e-course um, is, uh, you know, videos that will allow people to see exactly what I do, how to do it step by step. And it comes with mentoring and, you know, just that one on one interaction of them going out and doing it and us coming back together and saying, you know, looking at your work together and just making tweaks. And um, it's incredible to know that you could start basically with no knowledge, no experience and, you know, work up to a six figure income if that's what you want. Um, and that, that's not what everyone wants. You know, there's people that I've taught who just want a side job. You know, they just want a part time income leisurely, you know, and can make, you know, 40, 60,000, like kind of easily. <laughs> it's weird, but I, I've been given a gift and I want to share that with as many people as possible. So we, uh, we did this promo together and I, I think that's going to be an instrumental tool in helping to get this word out. You know, just give me the pitch right here, because I, I know being behind the scenes, there's like a, a there's a free gift involved, too, that you're sort of giving when people sign up. But what is it that you're what is your offer? How are you helping people? Yeah. So, I mean, that was the first part that came organically out of this process for me was writing a book, how to make money as a real estate photographer. And then uh, after that, I was like, well, I need to you know take this further. So sign up for the course. You get the book for free. Um, you get access to all the videos and the mentoring and you're, you're off to the races. It's awesome, man. So important, especially, uh, we're currently filming in 2021, still in the, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, hopefully this is a lot of longevity for your viewers that are watching it years from now, but, um, this is a time when so many people have lost their jobs. Um, so many businesses are, con uh, are closing, the economy is contracting and folks are looking for a way to simply survive. And you're saying, uh, what I hear from you is, you could not only survive as like a part-time thing, but you might even be able to make a great living doing this. And I align with you, man, enjoy life. Let's do something we love. I pinched myself every day. Now I've gone from being just the camera guy, well, among the other hats, to now I, I still operate the high-end projects and I'm a DP on those high-end projects, but a lot of stuff, my team operates the camera. And, and so maybe I'm just directing or maybe I'm just producing. So life has a way of morphing and changing, but I pinch myself. I get to do what I love like every day. It is so awesome. And I want that for your viewers. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things I talk about in the book is there's different paths you can choose, whether um, what, what I think is great about this particular uh, field is that if you want to run the show, you can. But if you don't and you're just that right side and you want to go make money for someone else and give them the headaches and you just shoot and be creative, you can do that, you know? So it, it's not just this one size fits all type thing. You can really kind of choose the path you want to do that works best for your personality and for you. That's awesome, Phil. Tell, tell us how we can connect with you. Cause I know I'm a friend on Facebook, but what are, what's your, your IG, your Facebook, all that stuff, your website. So lenslife.me is the, the place to go check out, you know, our merch for Lens Life as well as the e-course. Um, this podcast is on YouTube, um, Spotify and Apple podcast. And, um, I'm really just a TikToker right now. So that's, um, at real lens life. 
Um, but I, I'm going to be getting into the rest of the socials soon. But the, those those are the spots where I'm at right now, and you know, just looking to to grow and continue. It's awesome, man. You're providing a great service. I'm so happy to be able to chat with you today and share a couple of tips and tricks I learned along the way, and and uh, commiserate together some of those. Uh, painful moments that we've all gone through. Uh, but to our viewers, like, keep going, just rock, just crush it, crush it this year. Be excited. There is great things to come for all of us and um, get in the trenches, find a couple good mentors. Phil right there is going to be a great mentor. If, uh, if you want to sign up for his course, that's perfect. But um, even just someone in your life, you know, get people, surround yourself with people that are doing the stuff you want to do that are better than you are. And I've heard you become the average of the five people you hang out with most. So get the, that crew of people around you to help you become the better person. That's awesome. Thank you so much for being on and sharing all of your knowledge with us. This is a long episode, but I think so packed with so many different things. So thank you so much, Jason Schuler with Awakened Films. My pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. All right. Take care.